Hamilton uh, with the songs here. We got uh, the first song, Come Thou Almighty King. We're going to sing. It's going to teach. We're going to. Our, our, our worship should be driven by who God is, right? And so the first song is going to introduce us to the triune God, that God is the Trinity. We're going to sing about the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Second song is going to sing about the power of God. We, we sing the mighty power of God. Third song, we're going to sing about how God is a holy God. And the last song before, after the service, we'll talk about how God, each member of the Trinity, is part of the redemptive work, right? God sending the Son, the Son being the Redeemer, and Christ can, or the Spirit continuing the work. So hopefully as we... Sing about God, it drives our worship of, of, of God. All right, so we'll sing with number 71. We'll sing all four verses of number 71, Come Thou Almighty King. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this time that we can gather together to study your word and to know more about you. And Lord, um, as we learn more about you, may our love for you uh, grow. And Lord, may we um, know the things that please you and the things that do not please you, Lord. And I pray that you would uh, bring about that change in our lives, that we uh, might walk in a manner that, that is worthy of you. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue just to be with us and make us doers of your word. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, number six. We're going to sing number six. I sing the mighty power of God. First and second. First and second. the uh, power of God, the goodness of God, the wisdom of God, and now we sing about the holiness of God. Uh, ver- number 68, we'll sing uh, two stanzas of this one as well. Number 68. Sing uh, first and third. First and third. Of number 68.
I thought you said first through third. <laughs> Sorry, no, first and third. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, we've got a couple of announcements, but if the kids want to go ahead and go back to the back room there, uh, Rebecca will be teaching you all today. So I hope you have fun. And I hope the air conditioning's on back there. <laughs> yeah, be careful with the camera. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we have the ladies' ladies' Bible study. Ladies' Bible study will be uh, this coming Tuesday. So um, English ladies' Bible study at seven o'clock in the evening here at the church. And so if you have an opportunity to be here, that'd be great if you're a lady. And uh, then the next one will be on the twenty second, uh, Tuesday twenty second. So it's the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month. And so this, the, the 8th and the 22nd, uh, and then the ladies, Japanese ladies Bible study will be on Saturday, the first Saturday of every month. So they just had it yesterday, and the next one will be September 3rd, uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, also wanted to uh, remind people to, to pray, what's that? Oh yeah, October, this is September. <laughs> wow, where's this time going? <laughs> so next Japanese ladies Bible study is October, uh, the first uh, Saturday in October, so... Um, so now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> pray, okay? Let's go ahead and um, let's remember to pray for uh, one another, and then we'll pray for our missionaries. <clears throat> if you have a prayer request, we're going to start doing the prayer sheet again. <clears throat> and so if you have a prayer request you would like us to put on the prayer sheet or like us to pray for on a regular basis, um, please uh, write it on a piece of paper. I was going to make a little form, and I'll try to do that by next week, but uh, just drop it in the offering plate, and we'll try to put that on the sheet, or announce it on Sunday, or whatever, or if you want to put it anonymous, that's fine, or don't mention names, that's fine, too, we can, we can do whatever you want, but uh, so let us know if there's things we, you, we can be praying for each other about, and we'll let each other know, and because the Bible says, pray one for another, you know, so we're, we're supposed to pray for another, uh, so pray, remember our missionaries uh, that we support, uh, and then remember each other, uh, different, uh, last week we we emphasized uh, unsaved loved ones, and so uh, just pray for one another throughout this week that God would direct supply needs, and if you know of any per, per, uh, particular issue, uh, pray for that also. All right, today we're going to talk about, you know, it, it seems like we've been on uh, the end time prophecy, end time uh, uh, um, eschat- eschatology forever, but um, we uh, want to change gears here but just in like a transitional just uh, we're not in we're just between you know series or anything like that I'm thinking about what to, to do next we talk about uh, godliness okay the Bible of course mentions uh, the word godly a lot um, and uh, so have you ever thought about what godly is and what it means to be godly um, well there's one particular um, ver- uh, chapter in the Bible that we're going to we're look at today in Psalm chapter 1 that talks about godliness but godliness is um, in, in um, you know, if, if you know Japanese, the Japanese there, there's the word God is not in it, and in the uh, Eusebia, the New Testament word for godliness, also uh, that's not mentioning God. It's, t- it's talking about uh, uh, a attitude of your mind, which uh, in which God is the reason for what you do. Okay, in in your head, the God is the reason. In your heart, God is the reason for what you do. And so it's an action out of uh, respect for God. Uh, a God consciousness, if you would, if, if that will help you understand it better. Um, and so uh, in this psalm, chapter 1, which you're going to look at today, uh, the godly person is called uh, blessed or righteous. Uh, the ungodly is called ungodly or sinners. Okay? Uh, just to help you to understand how godliness is in uh, uh, understanding of God that you carry with you throughout your life in your actions of your life. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And so if you are a godly person, you are in all your ways acknowledging God. You are seeing God in everything that you do, everything that you experience. And because God is there, you know, God is not uninvolved. Uh, some people uh, think that God is uninvolved. He created us and then went away and he, didn't, he just left us alone. Um, that is not true. God works in our lives daily. I think 
John mentioned this this morning in Sunday school, but uh, God works in our lives all the time. He's not uninvolved. He's involved in our lives. Sometimes we don't understand what he's doing, and even uh, the Sunday school lesson was about Paul who didn't understand exactly how he knew that he was going to Rome, but he didn't see, you know, this doesn't seem like it's going to get me to Rome, you know. It didn't seem like, uh, but it did. And uh, so we need to trust the Lord in that aspect. But let's look at Psalm 1. Psalm chapter 1, I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's just uh, eight, six, six verses. Uh, Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall sta not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So there the blessed man is also called uh, righteous, and the ungodly is also called sinners. So ungodly, sinners, and blessed or righteous. Uh, we're going to look at three things about each of these people. Uh, by the way, everybody uh, falls into one of these two categories. Okay? They're either blessed or uh, they're godly or not godly. Uh, and we'll look at the cause, and then we're going to look at the characteristics, and then we're going to look at the conclusion or what that leads to. You, know, uh, you live the way you live because of what you believe. And the way you leave, live will determine your destination. Okay? your destiny and your destination and what happens when you get there. <laughs> so uh, the way you live is determined by what you believe and what, the, what will happen to you eventually is determined by the way you live. And so uh, the cause, characteristics, and conclusion of both godly and the ungodly. But let's start with the godly. Uh, what is the cause uh, given here as a, 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 of the godly? Uh, there, are three thing, there are two things. There are two things. That are, he mentioned. Uh, first is a list of things that he does not do. Uh, there are things that he does not do, and then there are things that he does do. A godly person is someone who will uh, not do certain things and does certain things. That his, his godliness will be manifest in that way. So number one, what he what he done. Number th verse one. I'm sorry. Talks about three things. It says, uh, "Blessed is a man that walketh not." in the counsel of the ungodly. So he doesn't walk in ungodly counsel. The things he does not do, he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, we are in this world, and we are influenced by this world. Or we, we, uh, the world is trying to influence us, and we're trying not to be influenced. <laughs> okay? But the world is trying to influence us. The world is constantly uh, pulling on us, trying to influence us. And so we are walking through this world and there is a pull of this world. Um, the attractiveness of the possessions of the world, the attractiveness of the pleasures of the world, the attractiveness of the power of the world. And we see people around us who desire those things. And if we're not careful, we will be pulled or influenced uh, by those things also and desire those things which are temporal like the world does. And so the ungodly is one who doesn't, first of all, walk in the counsel uh, and the godly is one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay? He doesn't uh, listen to, he doesn't adopt the values, uh, that, that which he's trying to, is trying to influence us he doesn't accept it, he rejects it. Okay? So it says he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, uh, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, and he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. Uh, the, the verse from goes on to say he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. And then finally it says, he doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. And I think you can see a progression there. There's a walking, standing, sitting. Uh, what is that? I think those are, are, um, I think those are um, degrees of influence that we allow the world to have in us. And if we're just walking by, the world does have an influence on but but if we're walking by, we're, we can uh, reject that influence. But when we start standing there and considering, you know, you walk by and you look and you stop and you consider and then soon enough you're sitting down and you're accepting uh, the values of this world. And so the godly person is the one that first of all, he is, he, he, when, as he's walking by, he doesn't, uh, he rejects the influence of the world. 
he he doesn't he he doesn't um, listen to the world. He, he's not drawn by the world. He's not influenced by the world. And then secondly, he doesn't stop and consider what the world has to offer. And then thirdly, he doesn't he doesn't uh, sit. Uh, sit down and, and uh, accept it. So he rejects all forms of influence of this world. If you're going to be godly, you have to reject the influence of this world. And that's why it's sometimes puzzling to me while preachers and things claim to be godly, um, but accept the influence of the world. I and mean, their, their churches do music of the world, their, their philosophy, they accept the philosophy of the world, they live in a way, their language, they adapt the language of the world. Uh, they look like the world, and uh, sometimes they say we're, you know, we're being like the world, so we're going to win the world. Well, if you're like the world, what's the world going to win? What are you going to win them to? You know, <laughs> what you win them with is what you win them to. You know, you can't be worldly and then say, okay, now you have to stop being worldly when you're worldly. You know, that's what you're winning them to. This worldly uh, form of uh, Christianity. But and so, the godly person is the one who, first of all, rejects the influence of the world. He he understands the influence of the world and one who doesn't understand the influence of the world will be like this man he'll be walking by he'll be stopping and he'll be sitting down and pretty soon he'll be influenced by the world and be uh, totally like the world okay so if you want to be godly you've got to be you've got to understand that there there is the influence of the world there are, are things around us that are pulling us if you don't understand that you're probably already pulled into the world uh, many people who don't understand they're in the world and they don't even know it okay uh, but the world has a pull on us it does. We cannot deny that. If you, you know, there's one extreme says the, the world has no influence on me. Oh yes, it does. You've got to be careful because it does. And you, you know, you look at people and you see what they have, and then next thing you know, you're wanting what they have. And then you see that you know they've they they're doing this kind of thing, and it's fun, and you know, and then you start doing that kind of thing, and and it's pretty soon you're you're in with the world. And so the godly person, first of all, there's things he does not do. He is not influenced by the world. He rejects. The influence of the world. Now, it's not enough to just reject the influence of the world and not be worldly. Okay, uh, to be godly, you have to be godly and not just worldly. And so, to counter the influence of the world, you must have another influence that is stronger than the influence of the world, and that is uh, the word of God. And so, there's things he doesn't do. He doesn't accept the influence of the world. And number two, uh, he has inf- he is influenced by something. Something. Okay. He is influenced by the word of God. Uh, Verse 2 says, uh, His delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now what is the law of the Lord? The word of God. His delight is in the word of God. Now do you delight in the word of God? Um, Sometimes we, I know we, we know we should read the word of God. And if we haven't read it, oh, we've got to read the Word of God and maybe we have a guilty conscience. And so we read because of a guilty conscience or we read because, you know, we, you know, we, we feel bad if we don't or kind of thing like that. But we need to love God's Word. Okay? Uh, many times the psalmist said, I love thy Word. You know? And uh, we, need to, we need to love God's Word. We need to um, delight in God's law. And it's not, if we don't delight in God's law, it's not... Because God's law is not delightful, okay? God's law is delightful. But if it doesn't delight you, it's probably because you think the world's things are delightful. And you think God's things are boring or undelightful or whatever you want want to say, okay? Because you've been influenced by the world. If you're influenced by God and His word, you will think His word is delightful. You will desire to know more about God, know more about His word. And constantly reading God's word and studying God's word and seeking to understand God's word and talking about God's word. And God's word will be uh, a, the greatest influence in your life. Uh, God's word must be a greater influence in our life than the world's influence in our life. If it isn't, we're not going to be godly. We're going to be worldly. So first of all, he delights in the law of the Lord. And then he meditates in the law of it. He delights in the law of the Lord and then he meditates in the law of the Lord. Uh, in his law of the Lord doth he meditate day and night, it says. And so, uh, not only does he delight in the law of the Lord, he meditates. Now, what does that word meditate mean? Um, I think that the Hebrew and the Japanese are more close than the English word. So, to, you know, meditate has a different connotation with some, some people think, you know, transcendental meditation is sit there and empty your mind. No, that's not meditation. 
Okay. Uh, the word in Japanese and in Greek are, uh, is to murmur. To murmur. You know, when you're walking around and you're talking to yourself, have you ever done that? Or have you ever seen somebody doing that? They're caught up with thought of something and they're doing something, but they're thinking about something else. And they're saying, you know, and, oh, yeah, you know, and they're, they're thinking to themselves, they're talking to themselves, they're, they're going over something in their mind. Okay? And that's what it means to meditate, to go over it in your mind and to think about it all the time. Uh, and when you're walking, when you're talking, when you, whatever, when, whatever you're doing, you're thinking about uh, God's Word and you're thinking about God and you're, you're trying to be influenced by God's Word and not the world. And it says he meditates in the law of God day and night. Day and night. All the time. You know, every waking hour and every sleeping hour. You know, um, your mind's going even when you're sleeping, I think, sometimes. <laughs> That's what I hear. Um, and, you know, if you're dreaming a dream, something's happening up there, you know. So, uh, and I'm not saying you can control your, you know, when you're sleeping, but every moment all the time is what that day and night means. Okay, uh, every moment, all the time, you're always thinking about God's word, and you're always thinking about how can I apply that word? How can I apply the word of God to this situation in my life? Uh, what can I do? What should I do in this situation because of what God's word says? And you're always keeping God's word in your mind. Now, if you don't read God's word, you're not going to meditate on God's word. Uh, and we've uh, many, many, many times. Uh, gone over uh, Proverbs chapter 2 where uh, you know, in the knowledge of God comes through uh, reading God's word, meditating God's word, um, praying God's word, uh, studying God's word, and then you will understand who God is and you will uh, find the fear of the Lord. Uh, but we, we must be influenced by God's word to be a godly person. Uh, and so we must read God's word, delight in God's word, we must meditate in God's word, all the time. If that's not your experience, then you're probably having not enough exposure to God's Word. Okay? You need to be exposed to God's Word. And you can be exposed to God's Word in many, many ways. You don't have to necessarily only read it. Uh, nowadays, you can listen to it on your smartphone or, you know, you can... Uh, all sorts of different ways that you can uh, take God's Word in. You can, uh, you know, read it on your, you know... If sometimes I'm be, I'll, I'll be thinking about something, I'll get out my, you know, look it up on my iPhone or something like that. It's, I don't have to wait till I get back to my library to look it up in the book. You know, I can just boom right there. You know, I got all these books on my, my phone or my iPad anyway. And so, you know, nowadays we can, we're very, it's probably easier as far as uh, accessing things, you know, studying, study tools uh, for God's Word. Uh, but we also have more distractions, okay? The same smartphone that you can use to help you to study God's Word can also distract you for, with meaningless and trivial things. Now, recreation is good, you know, if you're tired and, and you need a, something just to relieve your stress for a while, you know, that playing a game is not necessarily bad, but if that's your life, you know, <laughs> then you're be, be, that's part of the influence of the world, okay? And not the influence of the Word. And so we need to be influenced by the Word of God. So, the blessed man is the one who does not, he avoids the influence of the world. He turns away. He understands it and sees it. If you don't see the influence of the world, you're probably being influenced by the world because, and you don't know it. Or to at least to what extent you are influenced by the world. And so you need to, first of all, understand the world has a pull. It does try to influence us. And we need to actively reject the influence of the world. And then secondly, we need to uh, read God's Word and meditate on God's Word and study God's Word so that we can uh, overcome the influence of the world. How do you know what the world's saying is wrong? How do you know that? The world says uh, you have to love the world and the things of the world and the less of the flesh, the less of the eyes of private life. Those are things they pursue. Those are the things they want. Those are the things they seek. They do all sorts of things to get those kind of things. And they're saying you should too. And if you're not careful... You'll say, well, yeah, you know, that's fun and that's pleasurable and that's, uh, you know, profitable and yeah, I like that and let's do that, you know. And you read God's Word and it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But whosoever doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we need to read God's Word and understand those passages and when we see the world influencing us, we can say, oh, wait a minute, God's Word says this, and the world is trying to get me to do this, or believe this, and God's word says this. And so that's why we need to uh, 
God's word to overcome the influence of the world. And so the godly man is one who, first of all, resists the influence of the world and understands the influence of the world and resists the influence of the world because he's influenced by God's word. He knows God's word. He understands God's word. He knows uh, how to apply God's word to his life. Right? So uh, the cause of a godly man is uh, the influence of God's word. And then the characteristics. Uh, this psalm goes on to talk about the characteristics of a, God's word, uh, of a man that is influenced by God's word who is godly. Uh, verse 3. I'm sorry. Back up here. Uh, verse 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So he will be like a tree. Okay? There is stability. His roots go down deep and he cannot be moved. There is stability. You know, a tree that has deep roots, the wind can't blow it over. But if a tree has shallow roots, a little wind will blow it right over. Okay? And there's no stability. All right? uh, but uh, one who is in God's word, then there's stability. And a godly person, the, the characteristic of a godly person is, number one, he's st- is stability. He's not blown here and there and, uh, by every wind of doctrine, as Paul said in the New Testament. Uh, he, so he's st- is, there's stability, stable. And then he's watered. Uh, it says, um, uh, the, uh, he should be like a tree, verse 3, planted by the rivers of water. Okay? Why is this tree stable? This tree is stable because its roots go down to a source of water. So it is connected to a source of water. And it's constantly taking in the water, the water of the word, <laughs> to use a... Uh, uh, phrase from the New Testament in John, the water of the word, um, we can, if, if our roots are deep and we're connected to that water source constantly, we can constantly get that water, uh, that's what we need to uh, be godly people. We need the word of God and we need our, our roots to go down to give stability and then to get water from the word of God to supply the needs in our life. And then he is fruitful. It says... Um, uh, be, <clears throat> he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who bringeth forth his fruit. Bringeth forth his fruit. Okay? He brings forth fruit. There is evidence in your life. Uh, there is evidence in your life. Okay, You might not see that evidence and you might not know what that evidence is. But there is evidence in your life. There's evidence of trusting God and there's evidence of lack of trust of God. Are you always worried? That is evidence of lack of trust of God. Are you always, you know, um, biting your fingernails or anxious or uh, fearful or fretful? Uh, if you are in God's word and you understand that God is in control, God is sovereign, okay? And things might happen that we don't understand. Uh, you know, we can look through the Bible and we see things, people like Paul, uh, people like Job. You know, Job didn't understand what was going on, but he knew God. And he said, I don't know why this is happening to me. I mean, I've lived righteous and I don't know why that these things are happening to me. Uh, but he trusted God. He never denied God. His wife said, you know, curse God and die. Uh, but he did not. He trusted God. He said, you know, shall not, you know, we, we get good, good, good from God's hands and shall we not take, you know, that which we think is not so good also? Uh, and then God means it for good. You know, Joseph realized that God, you know, Joseph went through a lot of things uh, that were, didn't seem fair, you know. Um, he was just trying to do right. And God actually spoke to him and revealed things to him. And he re- revealed those to his brothers and his brothers tried to kill him for it. And he was like, He's, I- I'm the good guy. Why are you persecuting me? And he suffered persecution. And then, then he was faithful in Potiphar's house when he got down there. And, and, faith, and, and uh, Potiphar's wife got her eye on him and she lied about him. He got thrown into prison. He didn't do anything wrong. Okay? So Jeff was suffering, suffering, suffering. Uh, but God had a plan. God was working in his life to bring about good. And that's what God will do for us. And so uh, we need to be fruitful because God is working in our life. And then uh, it says, uh, shall bring forth fruit in his season. Okay? Uh, we're patient. God will work in our life. He will bring about things in our life in his time. Okay? But if we, don't, if we quit before that time, we won't experience that. Okay? If we quit before God has finished working and bringing us to a place of fruitfulness, then we're not going to be fruitful. We gave up before the fruit came because it took a long time. You know, 
Fruit comes usually uh, once a year, right? Now we have a cocky tree out there, a persimmon tree, and this year there's nothing on it. <laughs> they all fell off, but some years there's a lot on it. And about November, you know, it's ripe, and so sometimes we eat some at the church, okay? But uh, it's, it's a season. There's a fruit in a season. All year long, that tree is preparing for, you know, whatever it does. It gets the water and nutrition and things like that to produce that fruit. And so God is preparing us and working in our life all along, and just because we don't see fruit right now doesn't mean there's not going to be. It is a Christian, a godly person will be fruitful. God will produce fruit in that person's life. And so uh, he is fruitful in his time. So he's also patient. So another characteristic of a godly person is that he is patient. Uh, and then he is prosperous. Uh, verse 4 says, I'm sorry, verse 3, the end of it says, And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He's prosperous. So see, that says you can be have a lot of money and, you know, okay? Prosperity gospel is a false gospel, okay? And prosperous doesn't mean materially prosperous, okay? Materially, we're not, again, if you think that this is talking about material prosperity, you're probably being influenced by the world and your eyes are on the world and your desires are on the world. That is not what this prosperity is talking about. And if that's the prosperity you desire, you won't get it by studying God's word, Okay? <laughs> Uh, and so this is not talking about uh, physical prosperity. It's talking about spiritual prosperity. Being able to do what God wants us to do. Being able to live for God. Being able to live in a way that will please God. That's what prosperity is. And uh, many times people are hindered in their spiritual prosperity by their material prosperity. It's a hindrance. Uh, it's not a blessing sometimes. Now, now this not you know I'm not saying rich people are wicked. No has nothing to do with it, is what I'm saying. Whatever God gives you to do, you, you, you do that. You, you can be spiritually prosperous and financially prosperous, uh, prosperous or poor. I always like to look, uh, look at the rich man and Lazarus. It's my favorite illustration. <laughs> you know, the rich man, if, if you said, which one would you like to be? You'd probably say, oh, well, the rich man. No, he was, uh, and, and so the Jews considered him prosperous because they thought that material possessions were evidence of your right standing with God. And so they thought that the rich man was right with God. And they thought that uh, lack of material possessions was a curse from God. That, that meant that you were away from God and you were cursed of God. Okay? And so they would consider the beggar cursed of God and they would consider the rich man blessed of God. Okay? And they, they would have considered him to be, the rich man to be prosperous and the beggar to be uh, w wicked and God against him somehow. You know, when Job's friends quote unquote <laughs> came to him you know what they say Job you got some sin in your life get it right and Job says I haven't sinned oh yeah this is evidence when something bad happens it means that God is not pleased with you and God is punishing you you know and if you have a lot of possessions then maybe God's happy with you and no it has nothing to do with it okay prosperity is spiritual prosperity okay has nothing to do with whether, whether you're rich or not. It doesn't have anything to do with it. Maybe you're rich, maybe you're not, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. And if you seek to get rich, if that's the goal of your life, then you aren't spiritually prosperous and you're not godly because your goals are wrong. These material possessions are temporal. And uh, so we should seek to please God. Our, our constant thought in our minds should be about God. What does God want? What would please God? How can I live for God? How can I know God? How can I do God's will? That should be the desire in our life. And that's what we're going to be able to accomplish. And that's what prosperity is. Okay? A godly person will be prosperous. And he will be able to accomplish what God desires for him. And he will be able to experience the blessings that God gives him. They might not be financial, but they will be uh, spiritual. Okay? So, uh, the characteristics of a godly person. And then, lastly, the conclusion. What is going to happen uh, to the godly person? Okay? Um, number one, he's going to be prosperous, as we read in verse 4. Uh, he will be spiritually prosperous. He will be able to accomplish what God has him. And then he, it says, he, uh, verse 5, uh, The ungodly are not so, I'm sorry, verse 4, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So, uh, verse 5, uh, The ungodly shall not stand, meaning the godly shall stand. <laughs> okay? When judgment days come, they will stand. They will be standing. They will not be considered guilty. They will not be judged against. Okay? Uh, the ungodly will be judged against. They won't stand. They won't stand a chance. Okay? They, they will be condemned. But the godly will not be condemned in the day of judgment. Uh, 
uh, at the judgment seat of Christ or whatever. The godly will not be condemned, uh, but the ungodly will be. All right? He will, he will stand in judgment. And then, uh, verse 5 goes on to say, um, the, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, the assembly of the righteous. Uh, the sinners will not be in the assembly of the righteous. The righteous will. Those who are godly will be in the company of all those who are righteous. Those who are righteous will be together because we will all together seek to glorify God. You know, why would the ungodly person who doesn't care about glorifying God want to be in the congregation of the righteous? He wouldn't want to be there. You know, he doesn't seek to be there. He doesn't want to glorify God. If he don't want to glorify God, he wants to please himself. He doesn't care about God. And so why would he want to be in the congregation of the righteous? If you desire to be in the congregation, if you think it was a good thing to be in the congregation of the righteous, the, the company of saints and and the fellowship of those who are pleasing to God and those who glorify God and whose purpose is to praise and glorify God. And that's what the righteous is going to be able to do, the God will be able to do. And then verse uh, uh, 10, uh, I'm sorry, 6, the last verse says, uh, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Okay? The Lord knows us. You know, I mentioned this this morning. Um, do you, sometimes we think ourselves great. And usually it's when we compare ourselves to somebody underneath us, you know. Uh, oh, look how, you know, and I personally think this sometimes, you know. Whoa, you know, wow, I played that pretty good, you know. And I play a lot better than that person. But then somebody else will play, <laughs> and I go, oh, man, I don't know how to play nothing, you know. <laughs> it's reality, you know, reality. But sometimes, I don't know, we just get to the point that we think we're so great, you know. And uh, we're not great at all. You think about it, you know, you're, you're not great, you're not big, you're teeny weeny, easy beansy. You're one of, what, 8 billion people on this planet right now, you know? You're just one of those 8 billion people on this little bitty bitty teeny easy beansy earth. You think, oh wow, this earth is big, it takes several hours to fly around it. Well, you know, compared to the sun, we're teeny eeny beansy. And our galaxy, compared to other galaxies, is teeny. Our galaxy is huge, it's 100,000 uh, light years from one side to the other, a light takes like 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way galaxy. And that's just our galaxy. So if a, if a beam of light started at one end of the galaxy, it would take 100,000 years for it to reach the other side. That's how big and vast our galaxy is. And there are uncountable, you know, billions and billions of galaxies out there. And so how significant do you think we are? <laughs> you know, we're, not, we're not significant. But you know what? God knows you. If you're righteous, God knows you. He has a relationship with you. He works in your life. He pays attention to you. He, he does things in your life to, to help you to, to be more godly. And so God knows us. That, that in itself should be the highest. You know, whatever anybody else can offer or says, you know, God knows me and my ways. And so that should be a motivator to live for him, uh, if nothing else is. Okay, so that's the godly. And then it's real quick, look, in the time we have remaining, look at the ungodly. We'll look at the same uh, points about the ungodly. Uh, we'll look at the causes, the characteristics, and the, uh, the conclusion. Uh, the causes, there are two things again. Uh, things he does not do, and things he does do. Okay? Now, we'll take them in reverse order because... Um, whoops, sorry. Because ch verse 1 is something that the godly don't do, but the ungodly do. Verse 2 is something that the godly do, but the ungodly don't do. Okay, So there's kind of a reverse. So we'll take two, verse 2. Because the godly doesn't do these things, that the, the ungodly doesn't do these things that the godly does. He doesn't delight in the law of the Lord. That's why he's ungodly. That, that's one of the uh, uh, causes of his ungodliness. He doesn't delight in the law of the Lord. If he delighted in the law of the Lord, he would not be ungodly. But he's ungodly because he doesn't delight in the law of the Lord. He doesn't have anything to do with God's word. You know, a godly person is one who is, thinks about his, God is in his mind. God is in his consciousness all the time. An ungodly person is one who God is never in his consciousness. He hardly ever thinks about God. Anything he does, the, the goals of his life, anything he does, he doesn't do with a thought of God. He doesn't say, hmm, I, I want to do this, but God, no. He, do, he doesn't. If he wants to do it, he does it. His criteria is, do I want to do it? Will it bring me pleasure? Will it bring me prosperity? Will it bring me power? You know, will it bring me something? And that's, the, that's what he does. That's what determines what he does. 
He doesn't determine what he does by thinking, what would God say? What do God want? Let me see what God's word says about this. He doesn't think about that. He doesn't even consider it. Um, and the godly do. You know, the godly is one who considers. He doesn't do what I want to do, what my flesh wants to do. He does what God wants him to do. And he thinks, what would God want me to do? And God, he says, I don't care what he does. Then that doesn't. He didn't consider it. It's not like he's saying, I know God. You know, most of the time, it's not like he's saying, I know God wants to do this, but I'm going to do this. You know, he doesn't even think about God. It doesn't cross his mind. He's just thinking about what I want and what's pleasurable for me and what brings me profit and what brings me, you know, friends and whatever his motivation is, temporal things. And so he doesn't think about God. His delight is not in the law of the Lord. Uh, secondly, he does not meditate on God's word. He doesn't think about God. He doesn't read God's word. He doesn't think about God's word. He doesn't try to apply God's word to his life. God's word is not part of his existence. Okay? Just like the God it is. And then, it's always. He never. Okay? Just like the godly, uh, meditating God's word day and night, uh, the ungodly never think about God. You know, maybe once in a while they'll, you know, go to church and hear something about God. And uh, um, if God works in their heart and they accept, then God will continue to work. Uh, but most time they, you know, even if they're quote-unquote religious, they go to church as an obligation uh, just to, you know, get their religious obligation so they'll please God or whatever. It works salvation, you know. Uh, but the godly just never, never meditates on God's word, never thinks about God's word. Okay? And then there are things he does. Uh, there are things in verse 1, we talked about the things that the godly person does not do. Those are the things that the ungodly person does. He walks in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay? He listens to people around him that give him advice of how to prosper financially, physically, whatever. get what you want. How, how to get what you want. Okay? He seeks counsel on how to get what you want. He doesn't find that in God's word because God's word would say, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And not talking about seeking material possessions or temporal possessions. Okay? So the ungodly walks in the counsel of the ungodly. He stands in the way of sinners. He associates with sinners. And then he sits in the seat of the scornful. Uh, this word scornful is... is uh, probably we could understand it more by saying mocker. He's one who mocks God. You know, He's one who, not only does he just disbelieve God, um, he doesn't say, well, I don't know if there's a God or not, but I don't care. He does, but the scorner, he, this is not talking about the ungodly is a scorner. He say he sits in the, the seat of the scorner. He is influenced by scorners. Okay, And eventually he will become a scorner, but those who not only uh, don't believe in God, they mock God. They, they disbelieve God. <laughs> they do not they don't not just don't believe in God, they disbelieve. They, they, they mock those who do believe in God. That's stupid. You're so, oh, you're those religious nuts, you know. And there's no God, you know. Um, I hear people say things like, and they're not, not like, there's things that say, like, you know, all of us are stardust. And, and one guy, I heard a scientist say, you know, um, you're stardust, you're made of stardust, and, and, Christ didn't die for you, stars died for you, so you could have life. You know, it's like, that's mocking God. Not only is that disbelieving God, it's mocking God. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in his seat on Judgment Day, but uh, he's disbelieving God. He's, he's mocking God. He's mocking Christians. He is not, of course, he doesn't believe that God created everything, but not only does he not believe that God created everything, he uses the terms that Christians use to, uh, to express the dearness of their salvation, that Christ died for me. He says, no, no, the stars died for you, not Christ. Ha, ha, you know, laughing like that. So God, ungodly are, are, are influenced by scorners. They hear things like that and they say, oh, yeah, that's good, that's good. I'm going to have to remember that, you know. And they, they not only uh, are disbelieving God, they are listening to people who are actively opposed to God, mockers and things. Okay? And what is the characteristic of the ungodly person? He is unstable. He is not stable because he is roots don't go down. Uh, he is unstable. He is not watered. He doesn't get his uh, understanding from God's word, which gives him stability and understanding. He doesn't get water of the word. Uh, he is not faithful. Um, he is not fruitful. I'm sorry. He's not fruitful. He doesn't bring forth fruit in season. His, his fruit is the fruit of unrighteousness, not the fruit of that God produces and God desires. Uh, he is not patient. He wants it now. You know, the ungodly are living for now. Okay? They want pleasure. They don't think about eternity usually. You know, sometimes they do, maybe, but 
they're not motivated. Their actions now are not motivated by thoughts of eternity. Our actions should be motivated by thoughts of eternity. What will happen later? We, this world is temporal. We're not going to be here forever. We need to do what we do now in preparation for eternity. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, not upon earth where moth and rust corrupts it, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, our goal of our life should be eternal. The goal of an ungodly person is temporal. He, all he wants is the things that he sees now, and he wants them now. He's not willing to give up those temporal possessions and pleasures and power to obtain an eternal inheritance. He wants them now. He follows the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and he wants them now. And therefore, he is not godly because he is not patient. Okay? One of his characters, he's not patient, and he is not prosperous. You say, well, there's a lot of ungodly people who are millionaires, and some of them are billionaires, okay? Uh, some of them are billionaires, and they're actively against God. They mock God. They don't, you know, they would mock you if you said anything about God. They would laugh at you because they think that they're so smart because they figure things out and they're, they're prosperous. But they're not truly prosperous. They're not prosperous. You know, the rich man and Lazarus, if, you said, if I asked you which was prosperous, the rich man or Lazarus, you know, from a physical and human and a temporal standpoint, you would say the rich man was prosperous. And most people in the world that aren't Christians would say the rich man. I want to be like the rich man. He was a prosperous person. Well, he's in hell. He's been in hell for, you know, if Jesus, if, he, if it was, if this was an event that Jesus was describing when he was on the earth, he's been in hell for at least 2,000 years now, okay? Because that was 2,000 years ago that Jesus told about it, okay? So he's in hell. He's not prosperous. He was seeming to be prosperous temporally, but he wasn't prosperous truly and eternally, okay? And then finally, the conclusion. What is the end of, and I forgot to put these, uh, I just got them all there. So, uh, number one, he is useless. His life is useless. It, it turns out to be chaff. What is chaff? You know, when you, when you harvest rice or uh, wheat or something like that, uh, the, it's covered with a little shell, and you have to rub that shell off, get that off, because you can't eat that. That's, that's worthless. And, uh, you know, you go to the, go f around rice fields about harvest time here, and you'll see burning piles of chaff. You know, I kind of like that, that smoke smell, but, um, you know, it's just burning. You know, they, what do you do with the chaff? You burn it, or you throw it out, or you, you put it down so animals will step on it. I mean, it's worthless. It's useless. It's worthless. Okay, this, rich, this, this person, this ungodly person, his life is like a chaff. It's useless. It's like a chaff that the wind blows away. It just blows away and just doesn't mean anything. His life accounts for nothing in eternity. It's like he wasted his whole life. He might be a billionaire, but he wasted his whole life. His life is meaningless because it accomplished nothing for eternity. Okay? And so uh, the end, the conclusion of the life of the ungodly is that he's like a chaff which the wind drives away. Um, and then it says, He will not stand. Therefore the ungodly, verse 5, shall not stand in judgment. He will fall in judgment. He will be condemned in judgment. Not like the righteous. The righteous will stand in judgment. They will not be condemned in judgment. But this ungodly person will be condemned in judgment. He will fall in judgment. He stands before uh, the great, great, great right throne, uh, judgment of God. And God will condemn him and cast him to the lake of fire. And so he will not stand in judgment. Um, uh, and then verse uh, the end of verse uh, I'm sorry verse 5 says the ungodly shall not stand in judgment nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous okay? he will not stand with the righteous he won't be among the righteous in eternity you know, he didn't want to be among the righteous here uh, and he will not be among the righteous there he will not be ab among those who are with God forever and praising God forever and ever and ever. He will be in torments and torture and experiencing the judgment of God forever and ever and ever. And then finally, it um, says, The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The way of the ungodly will be destroyed. Destruction is in his future. He will be destroyed in hell forever and ever and ever. He will experience the eternal condemnation of God. And so... What about you? Um, are you godly or ungodly? Do you desire to be godly or ungodly? Uh, if you don't care about being godly, then you are ungodly. 
Okay? Because uh, godly people are those who seek God and seek Him in His Word. And they value His Word and they value God's will for their lives. And so, uh, you, you, can look, you can tell, you know, you might say, oh, I'm godly, you know, but... But what is the desire? Look at, your, look at the motivation of your life. What are you living for? Look at the characteristics of your life. What kind of characteristics do you display in your life? And then think about what is the conclusion of your life? What will happen to you in eternity? And so I hope you'll think about those things and I hope that will encourage you to be God. You know, we are influenced by this world. We, we, are, we are constantly pulled. Uh, the world seeks to pull us anyway. We shouldn't be. Uh, greatly influenced by the world, but the world seeks to pull. It's it's like a magnet. It cries to pull us and pull us and pull us to the temporal, to experience temporal pleasures and temporal prosperity and temporal power. You know, influence. Uh, and and we're we're constantly being. You know, people. All the people around us. The, a lot of people that we know in secular culture that are not Christians are. That's their active goal in their life, and they don't understand why that's not your goal if it is and so uh, that pull is there but we need to counter that pull by having a stronger pull in God's word and if God's word is not a dominating influence in your life then I guarantee the world is a dominating influence in your life and you know sometimes we are influenced by the world and we don't even re- realize it you know somebody gave me out my, my dad when, he was, when I was young he gave this illustration about a frog you know he said if you throw a frog in a boiling water it'll jump out but if you put a, put a frog in cold water and then turn the heat up slowly, slowly, slowly. He'll boil to death just sitting in the water. Because you know? he doesn't realize it's getting hotter. A little, bit, little by little it's getting hotter. And so uh, we are influenced by this world and we need to understand that. We need to understand there's the pull of the flesh. If you say, oh no, my flesh, I mean, you don't, I mean, you're probably losing. If you, if you don't think that you're being pulled by your flesh in the wrong direction, you're probably losing. Okay? It is a struggle. It is a battle against the flesh to fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life. You want certain things and uh, you know, God doesn't, you know, having things is not bad, okay? I'm not preaching against having things, and I'm not saying sell all you have and whatever, but the goal of your life should not be things. You should not be living for things. You should not be doing what you're doing for things. You should be doing what you're doing for God, because God, you want to please God, because God would have you do that, and that's what godly people do. Uh, and so we have to counter that pull of the world by God's word, being influenced strongly by God's word. The only way you can be influenced by God's word is to spend time in God's word, to read God's word, to meditate on God's word, uh, to talk about God's word, to think about God's word all the time, and talk about other people, and talk, talk about God's word with other people, uh, listen to sermons, whatever. Always being influenced by God's word that will counter the influence of the world, and we will be able to live a godly life one that pleases God, and then that life will be prosperous for eternity. We will, we, you know, we might not have anything on this, in, in this earth, but it doesn't really matter. We're only here for a short time, and every rich man that has the richest person in the world always leaves all of his riches when he passes out of this world. He can't take it with him. So it's not worth living for. So let's remember that, and let's let that influence life this week. Let's think about that this week as we're living. And then let's Live to please God in ourselves. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you reveal these things to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will convict us of uh, the fact that we are so many times influenced by this world and we allow ourselves to be influenced. Uh, But help us, Father, to be in your word and read your word and understand your word and obey your word and meditate on your word so that we can counter that influence of the world, so that we can live for you. You are worthy of our life. We are not. And so we pray that you use this for your glory this week. Work in each heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, sing one, just one verse of our final song, number 630, uh, 632. Oh, wrong side. 190. Oh, I always do that. I don't know. 190, just one verse of uh, There is a Redeemer.
Tommy, and uh, hope you'll be able to stick around for a little time of fellowship and get some snacks and things out here in a minute.